Hello everyone, today we're going to play a game that was released for the Nanoreno uh, 2017 jam. It's called Love Mythos Origins. Uh, Love Mythos is a game that I actually backed on Kickstarter, but unfortunately it didn't meet its full funding goals. But I hope that they're going to try again because I'd still be really happy to back the game. Um, but anyway, let's go ahead and we'll start this little origin story and we'll see what we get. Long ago, our peoples mixed much more freely than they do now. Satyrs danced with young human maidens. Pixies played with toddlers and whispered stories of the world's beginning. Fae and human histories intertwined as intricately as the two sides of a coin. But then something happened. It's hard to point a finger at what changed it all. Perhaps it was our poor horned brother being trapped in a maze all his life by a king with little outcry from our human allies. Perhaps it was the cursed Gorgon who had been betrayed by the goddess she swore to protect. Perhaps it was simply greed. But as the eons passed, human and fey grew in enmity and distrust until soon the opposing sides were at the brink of war. It is odd how life sometimes makes such small ripples create mighty waves in the sea of life. But just when it seemed the violence was at its peak, and our world was to become embroiled in hate and misery, the two sides came to a bit of a stalemate. You see, there was an oracle of great renown and incredible power, and both the Fae and humans wanted her on their side. It was in her temple that the two leaders met with her, each presenting why she should choose to denounce the other. The oracle listened, her eyes reflecting the light like the celestial crystals that hung from her ears. The leader of the Fae, a mighty Madramonte with eyes of vivid emerald and a tenacity unlike any other for protecting those in her care, argued that the covetous and violent nature of humans was unstoppable that they would want more, 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 until there was nothing left. That even their own gods were beginning to abandon them, disgusted by their lust for power. And the human, a mighty general with hundreds to battle to her name, spoke of the greatness they could achieve together. She roared of massacres wrought by corrupted sirens who lured men and women alike to their deaths. She preached of the peace that her armies had brought to the lands had previously been rife with chaos. And then, she whispered of the times that they had shared under the moonlight. How could the oracle forget the general's calloused hands against her or the soft pressure of their lips against each other? They were destined to be legends, together. But in this temple, this shrine to the responsibility of destiny, the oracle saw time stretch out from her like a branching river. In one path, the rivulet's streams and tributaries gave flashes of what, of what might be should she side with the fae. Through those branches she saw death, destruction, and blood, human mothers screaming for their dead children, bodies ripped to pieces and scattered across the landscape. Yet, when she turned her gaze to what should happen should she choose the great general, she saw only fire, wars, and more death. Harpies screaming over shattered nest, Angate with sawed-off horns, their hands bound in shackles, and their hindquarters chained to the plow. She saw whips, slavery, and insurmountable pain. So, the fae leader asked, shall you side with us or them? It was then that the oracle stood, and they were reminded of why she was so revered. The air crackled with energy, and when she spoke, her voice was both great and terrible. Melodious, like the sweetest song, yet thundering like a storm rolling in from the sea. What I choose, she said, forcing the great women before her to their knees, is life. Her eyes glowed fiercely, reflecting the power she held within. Have you forgotten your vows to your people, to protect them, to serve them? 
This fruitless war will end with both of your kinds destroyed and in pain. The only way I can help you is to tell you to lay down your weapons and return to your own lands until you are capable of negotiating a peace with each other. And in that moment, the great Fey King realized her errors, that her obsession with revenge on the humans was fruitless and would bring only pain. The human, however, fought her way to her feet, drawing her sword. Tears streamed from her dark, dark eyes as she lunged at the oracle, for she saw the oracle's decree as a betrayal and felt that if she could not have a seer, that no one on this plane of existence could. All the fae present moved to save her, but there was no need. A blinding light flashed from the core of the seer, and when those in the room regained their vision, the humans were gone. I sent them away, the oracle murmured, answering the unasked questions in the fae leader's eyes. But she will return for me. I have bought you time, but not much. A hundred years, perhaps two. In that time, you must find a way to hide yourself. The Madramonte did not understand her warning. What do you mean? Humans live short lives. Surely she can only be a threat for a few more decades, and without her we can find a way to calm the other human hordes. A look of passive melancholy drifted across the oracle's beautiful face. I am afraid I gave her a gift long ago, one that I did not foresee being so dangerous. She will have a form for as long as I do. Our lives are intrinsically tied to each other, and she will not rest until she finds me again. But Oracle, hide yourself, great king. That is the only way to survive them. Make them forget you ever were. And what will you do? Take my own advice, of course, and disappear. Goodbye, my friend. In another flash of light, she was gone, leaving the Fey leader to retreat back to her home. And that, my friends, is why we Fey live either behind our shields or must use glamours. I applauded from the barrel I was perched on, although I was a bit dubious about the veracity of his tale. Still, it was a very, very long journey to our destination, so I wasn't going to argue with a free on-deck entertainment. Thank you, I'll be here most nights, and remember, you can always count on your resident records keeper, Khalil, to know everything about anything. The crowd began to disperse, no doubt making their way to their cabins or cots, but I waited until there was a clear path to the handsome Sphinx. It's very generous for you to educate us poor masses out of the kindness of your heart. Some say that, but perhaps I just like the sound of my own voice almost as much as I'd like the sound of the name of a lovely fae such as yourself. And if you don't mind me asking, how do you prefer being referred to? Normally, I would find such a schmarmy introduction off-putting, but the eyebrow wiggle and over-the-top tone made it a bit charming. Oh, you get to even choose your pronouns? I'm called Bell. Of course, that makes sense. I'm glad you think so. And did someone think long and hard before naming you? Why, of course. We Sphinxes takes names very seriously. It speaks to the destiny of the child. I see. And how do you prefer being spoken to? Well, your imperial storyteller and rogue chronicler of histories is a bit long, so he, his, him will do fine. I think I can handle that. The Sphinx gave a laugh, an easy-going sound that slid over my ears like dulcet tones of a rhapsody. I'm surprised, last I knew Sprightly Fae didn't have the strongest concept of gender. Now it was my turn to laugh. True, but I was raised in the Ola, Aw Ola Awawa. There are hundreds of different fae there. 
While that may be true, I read a lot. You'd be amazed what you can find out between the covers of a book. What can I say? A sprites don't like the confinement of you landlocked phase. Um... I prefer squirrels, but the sentiment is shared. Trust me, my dear. Hmm. What are you? He put his hand to his chin as if he was considering me, and I could feel his brilliant eyes scanning me from head to toe. <clears throat> Fairy? No, wait, your ears are too pointed for that. Nixie? Pixie, but close. Most don't even know there's a difference. Well, most people aren't me, are they? I guess not. I clambered on top of a large coil of rope, as it was my nature's to do. It was no secret a sprightly fay liked to perch places. So what is a royal record keeper doing on a glamoured ship in the middle of an ocean? The same as everyone else, I suppose, hoping for more opportunity, less of the chains that tie us in place in our homelands. That's awfully poetic. Or poetically awful. I haven't quite decided on which one yet. Maybe it's a little of both. Both? I like it when you can choose both. Sadly, that doesn't happen too often. The Sphinx shrugged and shot a broad wink my way. I suppose that depends on what kind of ending you unlock. Ending? That's a depressing way to look at it. I prefer to think of them as new beginnings. How very sprightly of you. Hmm, that sounded speciest. You're not being speciest, are you? I would never. That wouldn't be very scholarly, after all. We laughed again, and it felt quite nice. It had been too long since I had bantered with someone. Tell me, how is it I haven't run into this quick-witted pixie with the ever-ready comeback? This isn't exactly the biggest ship, and we've been sailing for a week. Seasickness. I've been below deck in the makeshift infir infirmary they have down there. I gave him a sheepish look, but I was pleased to see that he appeared amused rather than repulsed. Like you said, you normally don't see my kind on the open sea. I guess there's a good reason for that, then. I was a bit amazed at how easy it was to talk to this charismatic sphinx. When I had wandered above deck following my release from the healer's quarters, I hadn't known what to expect. Whatever I had been anticipating, it certainly wasn't a large crowd listening to a story being told by a handsome fae, with skin that reminded me of the deep velvet that covered the night sky, and green eyes that shone with a light that spoke of knowledge I would never have. Yet here I was, sitting and chatting for hours with the Sphinx, until eventually he yawned and contorted himself in a particularly feline stretch. I think it is time a walk among the dreamers. I have not slept in days from excitement. But well met, Belle. I hope to see you again. Well met indeed, and I don't see how you won't. I hopped down onto the deck and headed back towards my cot that I had yet to use. Although it was still day, I was exhausted from just recently recovering. I was located in a tent towards the back of the ship with the other passengers from Ola Awala. I found my pack and settled down onto the cot next to me. By the way, if I'm mispronouncing these things, I'm really sorry. The night had certainly taken an interesting turn. I couldn't wait to see what the future held. I could feel sleep slipping away from me, and I tried to cling to it stubbornly. But as consciousness nipped at my mind, I realized I was nauseous again, dangerously so. In fact, I think I was about to... A thundering clap jolted me upright before I could finish that thought, and I rolled to the side just to heave violently onto the deck. However, I realized that I did not have time to worry about being rude to my sleeping mate as a huge wave crashed through our tent. 
For a moment, everything was chaos, screaming, and a lot of wet. But then I managed to scramble out of the remains of our sleeping quarters to see it was all hands on deck as the storm raged around us. What can I do? What can I do? I scrambled over to the nearest ship hand and they shoved a rope into my hands in reply. I didn't really know what that meant, but I guess he was trying to hold something down, so I held on to it with all my might. That didn't really work. I was flung into the air almost halfway up the mast. If I weren't a winged fay, it might have been the end of me. But my gossamer iridescent appendages unfurled themselves, humming anxiously as I killed my momentum and held myself in place. And for a moment, I felt very much alive. The wind whipped at my hair, the storm crackled around me while the waves boiled virulently down below. I was at the center of it all, and I could feel the thrum of mighty nature rush through me. Mother had warned me of this. Pixies had a particular weakness for getting swept up in the terrible, incredible, and lethal beauty of natural disasters. But then, a bolt of lightning cut through the sky and made my, rever and my reverie, striking at something above my head that I couldn't see, resulting in an almost blinding shower of sparks, followed by the sharp stab of magic surging, surging, then fading out of existence forever. I didn't need a ship hand to tell me what had happened. Our glamour was gone, which meant we were visible to other ships. Human ships. But what were the chances that a human ship would be out in the middle of a star- As if fate herself was laughing, I saw the bow of another vessel cutting through the waves. For a brief moment, I had a faint hope that it was another ship being hopelessly tossed by the storm as we were. But those hopes quickly faded when I saw the metal spiked bow reflecting the light of a hundred flaming arrows suddenly sailing towards us. I screamed and swooped low to find the deck again, but the volley of arrows pushed me higher. The wind was even stronger towards the tip of the mast, and I clung to it to keep myself from being gusted off into the deep, frothy waters. My small heart was thundering as I watched the fiery barbs hit their targets, and a cacophony of screams rose up to meet me. I had to do something. I had to... There was another deafening crack. This time, it wasn't thunder, but rather the sound of a massive, spear-like thing burying itself into the mast just below me. I gasped, and noticed a rope was leading from the end of it to our attacker's boat. No, no, no. This couldn't happen. I let go enough to slide down to the edge of the massive blade, my feet standing on the smooth, flat stone. I knew I had to get it off. I couldn't let them tip us over or drag us closer. So I jumped, coming down as hard as I could on the strange spear. I heard the splintering of wood and felt the reverberations, but it wasn't enough, so I jumped again. And again. I heard the hissing of even more Im immolating arrows cutting through the wet air, and it wasn't until one burned through the sleeve of my robe that I realized they were aiming at me. I didn't have much time now, seconds really. This was what my mother had warned me about. Don't go, Belle. It's dangerous, Belle. But no. I had wanted adventure. I had wanted excitement. Well, I was certainly getting my fair share. I swore to myself as I jumped and jumped, pushing my feet as hard as I could down on the spear. And finally, after I was sure I was going to fail, there was a glorious sound of wood cracking and the top of the mast began to fall to the side. The spear dropped and I hovered for a moment, breathless in my victory. That was my mistake. Suddenly, it felt like I was run through by an Ifrit. Screaming, I looked to see an arrow poking out of my side. That was definitely not supposed to be there. I tried to slide down the rest of the mast, but I only got a few feet before stopping short. Confused and bleeding, I looked up to see my wrist was caught in the loose netting used to clamber into the crow's nest. The crow's nest that was currently falling into the deep. I struggled, I tried everything to get my wrist out or to tear it away, but I only had seconds and I was weakening with every passing one of them. 
And when that fractured pole finally toppled, I knew my time had come. Down I went with it, watching it stra- watching in strangely slow motion as I passed the chaos on deck, then the side of ship, and then finally crashed into the water. Pain pummeled me with the force of a thousand charging minotaurs, and then I knew only darkness. Well, holy shit. Let me get a drink of water before I continue. The first thing I was aware of was that I hurt a lot. The second thing I was aware of was that I hurt even more than I initially thought. It felt like my back had been simultaneously scorched by flames and pummeled by a giant. I wanted to open my eyes and take inventory of the damage, but I couldn't. I could hardly move anything. But slowly, ever so slowly, I forced myself back into the realm of the living and opened my eyes. Come on, Belle. I tried to whisper to myself encouragingly, but my throat was raw and my tongue was practically encrusted with salt. Wow, I was thirsty. So thirsty. Suddenly, the scalding pain in my back didn't seem to matter at all compared to my overwhelming need to drink. I pushed myself up, desperate, but only made it a few inches before crashing back into the sand. I cried, or at least I wanted to, but there wasn't enough moisture in me to shed tears. How long had I been under those waves? It was daylight. Was it the next day? A couple of days? I don't know. I only knew that I needed a drink. You poor dear, you've been through Hades and back, haven't you? I craned my neck, but there was no one around. Great. I had skipped over the whole slowly going insane trope and skipped right to certifiable. Fantastic. I was still thirsty. Come now, you can sit up, I promise. Just listen to the sound of my voice. No, I can't. And now I was talking to a voice that wasn't real from a person who wasn't there. That didn't take long at all. Yes you can, darling, just listen to my voice. Feel your muscles contracting and your pain ebbing and sit up. Somehow that worked. I felt the dizzying pain fade just enough for me to slowly push myself to my knees and sit back on my haunches. For a moment, I was very sure I was going to pass right back out again, but a soothing kind of coolness settled over me. It didn't banish the pain, not by far, but it gave me a sort of opiated indifference to it. There you are. I'm very proud of you. When you're ready, we're going to go on a little walk, okay? I have a surprise for you. I didn't want to go on a walk. It hurts. I'm tired. Oh, I know, my friend, and it will hurt more, but you must do it. You understand that, correct? You must get up. You must. Well, who was I to contest such a compelling argument? Carefully, I forced myself to my feet and somehow made it to a mostly upright position. The world swirled around me, a kaleidoscope of pain, thirst, and sand, but I managed to make one hesitant step. Very good. Now take another. Fantastic. I knew you could. Now another, and another. Yes. Keep going. Follow me. I don't know why I'm doing this. Because you want to survive, of course. If there is one thing I've learned, it's that life will do anything to make sure that it keeps on going. Whatever you say. My voice was barely a rasp, and every single bit of my body was screaming in protest. But I kept on. I moved each foot unsteadily through the infuriatingly shifty sand until I was off of the beach and within the tree line of the island. I kept moving, refusing to stop, until I finally stumbled into a clearing in the thick foliage. You were amazing. You're almost there. Just go to the lake and drink, slowly and deeply, until you're full.
Lake? What lake? Oh. My eyes slid to the sparkling body of impossibly clear water, just a few feet ahead of me. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Stumbling forward, I collapsed at the edge and all but submerged my head underwater. Cool, refreshing, life-giving liquid surged through me, and I felt a little more coherent and a whole lot less dead. Unfortunately, with new coherency came a new blinding wave of pain. I was finally lucid enough to realize just how in pain I was. It wasn't the best feeling. I let out a whimpering cry, wondering if I would ever stop hurting, when I felt that same coolness settle over me once more. Hush, hush, my poor friend. You did so well, you earned your rest. I'm here to help you, but you must do one last thing. I groaned in protest, but the hallucination went on. I need you to summon me. Can you do that? Just close your eyes, and with all your might, wish me into this plane of existence? You're not real. I am very real, my dear. Just hidden. Hidden so deeply or so long, I cannot come to you unless there is a great need. Your life is that great need, but you must call for me. This was ridiculous. Completely the product of my delusional mind that was in mid-breakdown after trauma. I had read enough to know that shock can do some crazy things. I just never thought it would be so... vivid. I could hear the voice, like it was really there, and I could feel this strange presence like someone was right beside me, but veiled by sheets of gossamer and spider silk. That was impossible, right? Please, just call me. That's all you have to do. Well, what exactly did I have to lose? And actually, I'm going to stop it right here because I already went over the time that I wanted to spend on the first episode of this because I just enjoyed it so much. Um, so I'm going to stop this episode here. I will pick up and do another episode of this because I really want to finish out um, this origin story. Um, so I hope you'll tune in next time. Thanks for staying through with me this time. Uh, make sure you click my icon, which will show up on the screen in the corner, to subscribe. That way you'll get the notification for the next episode of this video. Um, and as always, thanks for being here, and I will see you next time. Bye!